Welcome to A Journey Through the Message. My name is Robert. And my name's Heidi. And we are so glad to have you along for this ride. If you are just joining along with us for the first time, thank you so much for choosing to just go on this little journey through the message. We are reading through the Message Bible, and it's just a paraphrase of the Bible, little different translation, much more conversational. And in my opinion, it really gets you to stop and think about some verses in just a little different light. I agree that even even for, let's just say, those really rock-solid Christians that have been since birth, sure. I think this is even great for them because I think after a while, especially those common Bible verses that you have memorized or things that you read a lot, even just generally speaking, I think it's eye-opening and it makes you stop and really think about what it's saying. So I really have... I initially started this thinking this would be great for those new to Christianity or newer to the Bible, that this would be great in helping them to understand. But as somebody who was immersed, I can say this is so refreshing and it's opening my eyes and it's building a curiosity and an interest that the King James did not do for me. It has a way, I mean, it had a way of making uh, Leviticus all of a sudden, very interesting. (laughs) I'm trying to prep myself for my reading of, so... We're going to switch things up a little bit here, and uh, Heidi will be reading a portion of Leviticus, and uh, and I'll be reading some other ones. I know, uh, that's a surprise for all of us. I found that out when I sat down, so I had to hold... I'm I'm in the process now of regrouping my mindset because I was ready to jump back into some uh, Psalms and that kind of stuff, but uh, I'm going to regroup, and I'm just... I'm reading differently. Well, regardless of where you are at on the journey, if this is your first time ever even looking at the Bible, or if this is your thousandth time looking at the Bible, or even hundred thousandth time, we're glad that you're here. And we hope that through this, you're able to just see things maybe in just a little different light, or maybe just learn a little bit about Heidi and I, because we love sharing a little bit of our personal stories as we go. Before we get started, I always like to say a quick prayer, and I was looking at my office yesterday at Crossroads, and I saw a little prayer journal, Mm -hmm. and I looked at it, and I said, you know what? I think this is something that it's worth praying about and uh, some of the things that were in there. So I'm just going to read the first one that was on there today, and uh, then I'll go right into a little prayer, and then we'll start out with Matthew. All right. I'm loving that you're doing this, actually, because I've been challenging myself to I get, do better at prayer, for lack of a way of putting it. Mm. I have been so opposed to those formal prayers yeah. because of prior experiences. I don't pray that way. I refuse to pray that way. I have even refused to learn how to pray that way because it brings up such a feeling of fakeness to me. Mm -hmm. And I want to challenge myself because I believe there there are people that give a formal prayer that are sincere and they mean it. And I need to recognize that and be able to also pray in that way and feel that I'm connected to God because I can't even keep my attention on what I'm doing when I pray that way. I'm just off and running. So I think this is great that you're doing it. So this is about a student of ours and her name is Zoanne. So Zoanne is in Minnesota and she wrote here, this is a quote from her. It said, I used to think that I didn't have a testimony, but now I know that I do. God has brought me through so much. When I received my federal sentence of 24 years for dealing methamphetamine, I was so devastated. But each day, God showed me that he was with me in the way that he has taken care of my four children and how he has given me strength to make it in here. I now know that God is the only way. The life that I was leading before was the path to nowhere. And so today... With Crossroads, we want you to pray for students of ours who are mothers Mm. and really just mothers, I would say, in general around the world. So this says, according to the Vera Institute, nearly 80% of women in jails are mothers. So join us in praying for women like Zoanne 
who are separated from their children because of their incarceration. And for a very long time. Yeah. So, Father God, meet people exactly where they're at. People like Zoan that may have 20 years to do, kids on the outside, family. Her crimes, and she knows this, have affected more than just her. Mm. And your healing hand can go in and repair relationships, restore things, and just bring a different sense of peace. So I pray for that today, that your sense of peace is on all mothers who are incarcerated, that are worried about their kids, that are worried about their family, that are worried about their home life, that are worried about getting out and trying to reintegrate back into their family, back into society. So, Father God, give us who are on the outside a heart that is willing to receive them and show them that they are welcome and that there is a place for them. Bless our reading today. Uh, Bless anyone out there who just needs that little bit of hope. And uh, I just pray that you're able to show that to them somehow through your word and lead them to that place of peace and hope. So I ask this all in your holy name. I pray. Amen. Amen. All right. So we are starting out here on chapter 19 in Matthew. And we're going to be reading verses 1 through 15. If you want to follow along in your favorite translation, that is great. Uh, But we're going to be starting out here. And this is titled Divorce. When Jesus had completed these teachings, he left Galilee and crossed the region of Judea on the other side of the Jordan. Great crowds followed him there, and he healed them. One day the Pharisees were badgering him, Is it legal for a man to divorce his wife for any reason? He answered, Haven't you read in your Bibles that the Creator originally made man and woman for each other, male and female? And because of this, a man leaves his father and mother and is firmly bonded to his wife, becoming one flesh, no longer two bodies, but one. Because God created this organic union of the two sexes, no one should desecrate his art by cutting them apart. They shot back in rebuttal. Well, if that's so, why did Moses give instructions for divorce papers and divorce procedures? Jesus said, Moses provided for divorce as a concession to your hard-heartedness, but it is not part of God's original plan. I'm holding you to the original plan and holding you liable for adultery if you divorce your faithful wife and then marry someone else. I make an exception in cases where the spouse has committed adultery. Jesus' disciples objected. If those are the terms of marriage, we haven't got a chance. Why even get married? But Jesus said, not everyone is mature enough to live a married life. It requires a certain aptitude and grace. Marriage isn't for everyone. Some, from birth, seemingly never give marriage a thought. Others never even get asked or accepted. And some decide not to get married for kingdom reasons. But if you're capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, do it. One day, children were brought to Jesus in the hope that he would lay hands on them and pray over them. The disciples shooed them off, but Jesus intervened. Let the children alone. Don't prevent them from coming to me. God's kingdom is made up of people like these. And then after laying hands on them, he left. And that's all we have for chapter 19. Mm, I love how he loved children. I love how he loved children too. I like the verse where he says, uh, but if you are capable of growing into the largeness of marriage, Mm -hmm. do it. I will say that when I was 18, 19 years old and I got married the first time, I had no concept of the largeness of marriage. Oh, for sure. It was more of a checking off the box. We had our son was born out of wedlock, and uh, it was more of a we're trying to just do the right thing. And at the time, we thought that that was the right thing, but we had no clue 
what the largeness of marriage mm-hmm. was. I think that's where um, good Christians can come around these couples also because they need to stop doing the quote unquote shotgun weddings or it's an automatic, well, this is it. This is the rest of your life. We need to be very careful about the situations we put our young people into that they are not prepared for. I completely agree. That is far worse for that child than a different scenario that isn't so tension-filled. So I think that Christians, too, have often failed young people just in the guise of, but it has to look good. And uh, we've we have to have people looking at this situation that happened and there has to be they have to look at it in a good light. So you have to quick throw a Band-Aid on that. Mm -hmm. And meanwhile, underneath that Band-Aid, there's this infection and it's growing, It's starting to go down into your bones. Right. And yeah. Yeah. This is a young couple that hadn't even considered getting married. Yeah. No questions had been asked. No plans were made for that. No dreams. Dating and obviously, yes, had premarital sex. And that's a, you know, a whole nother conversation, not what we're speaking of right now. But yes, I'm seeing how problematic the mindset is that we need to quickly, hastily just get them married off real quick. So this, you know, putting pretty wrapping paper on something that shouldn't have been permanently bonded doesn't make it healthy underneath that wrapping paper. And it doesn't mean that it's blessed by God either. Exactly. And I think that's a hard thing for some Christians to hear, but not every marriage is what God has put together. No. And no. I I experience firsthand what that means. Me too. Yeah. With this lady I know named Heidi. Yeah, <laughs> same thing. I have a what God has put together, and I can tell you there is a profound, Found difference in this relationship than yes. anything else I've ever experienced. And I am thankful that my God is so full of grace and has forgiven my prior poor choices. <laughs> yes. Amen. I'm in that same boat. And now Heidi is going to be picking up in Acts and she is reading out of Acts chapter 26 and it'll be verses 1 through 18. And then I do have a pause to read after you're done with that. All right. This is entitled, I Couldn't Just Walk Away. Agrippa spoke directly to Paul. Go ahead. Tell us about yourself. Paul took the stand and told his story. I can't think of anyone, King Agrippa, before whom I'd rather be answering all these Jewish accusations than you. Knowing how well you are acquainted with Jewish ways and all our family quarrels. From the time of my youth, my life has been lived among my own people in Jerusalem, practically every Jew in town who watched me grow up, and if they were willing to stick their necks out, they'd tell you in person, knows that I lived as a strict Pharisee, the most demanding branch of our religion. It's because I believed it and took it seriously, committed myself heart and soul to what God promised my ancestors. The identical hope, mind you, that the 12 tribes have lived for night and day all these centuries. It's because I have held on to this tested and tried hope that I'm being called on the carpet by the Jews. They should be the ones standing trial here, not me. For the life of me, I can't see why it's a criminal offense to believe that God raises the dead. I admit that I didn't always hold to this position. For a time, I thought it was my duty to oppose this Jesus of Nazareth with all my might. Backed with the full authority of the high priest, I threw those believers. I had no idea they were God's people. Into the Jerusalem jail right and left. And whenever it came to a vote, I voted for their execution. I stormed through their meeting places, bullying them into cursing Jesus. A one-man terror obsessed with obliterating these people. And then I started on the towns outside Jerusalem. One day, on my way to Damascus, armed as always with papers from the high priest authorizing my action, right in the middle of the day, a blaze of light, Light outshining the sun poured out of the sky on me and my companions. Oh, King, it was so bright. We fell flat on our faces. Then I heard a voice in Hebrew, Saul, Saul, why are you out to get me? Why do you insist on going against the grain? I said, 
Who are you, Master? The voice answered, I am Jesus, the one you're hunting down like an animal. But now, up on your feet, I have a job for you. I've handpicked you to be a servant and witness to what's happening today and to what I'm going to show you. I'm sending you off to open the eyes of the outsiders so they can see the difference between dark and light and choose light. See the difference between Satan and God and choose God. I'm sending you off to present my offer of sins forgiven and a place in the family, inviting them into the company of those who begin real living by believing in me. What a beautiful chapter. I think sometimes we gloss over how anti-Christian Paul was. Yes. <laughs> or Saul, I should say. Yes, because we mean, rave about Paul. Yeah. And yeah, we and forget about Saul. It's easy for us to think of all the good that he did, all the books in the Bible and all this other stuff. But when you stop and look at who he was and what he was doing before his conversion, God literally picked the least likely he person. He sure did. <laughs> he did. He w- and he went right for the one who considered himself the chief yes. of all the Pharisees. There is a quick pause here from Eugene Peterson uh, about chapter 26. And it's titled, We Don't Need to Defend God. And I'll read that and then we'll move on. In line with defense procedures, Paul could have done one of two things. He could have explored the nature of the charges against him, that he was a subversive person, and then shown that they had no foundation. Or he could have thrown himself on the mercy of the court. But Paul did neither. His defense was neither a defense in the obvious sense or a capitulation to the inevitable realities of power. Rather, it was an offense an invasion of the courtroom with the message of the gospel. What Paul did was preach a sermon. Paul was supposed to be defending himself, persuading King Agrippa of his innocence, but instead, he addressed the king in personal terms and attempted to persuade him of his need for a savior. King Agrippa was suddenly on the stand. He was on the defense, And he would have to face the eternal question squarely. The best defense is still a good offense. What the world needs is not evidence for the deity of Christ or arguments for the existence of God. What it needs and what will bring it to its knees in adoration is a confrontation with someone to whom Christ means everything. We don't need to defend God. He is perfectly capable of defending himself. What we do need is to live in obedience to him and to enter the world with a confidence and enthusiasm that spring from having our lives centered on him. I love that. I have often said, we're not the gatekeepers in heaven. We, no. we don't need to do that for no. God. He is big enough. He's got that all figured out. All figured out. I know. Puny little men (laughs) and women thinking God needs our assistance. And now I'll be rewinding back to the Old Testament, and I'm going to be picking up in Psalms chapter 42. This one is titled, A Psalm of the Sons of Korah. A white-tailed deer drinks from the creek. I want to drink God, deep drafts of God. I'm thirsty for God alive. I wonder, will I ever make it? Arrive and drink in God's presence? I'm on a diet of tears, tears for breakfast, tears for supper. All day long, people knock at my door, pestering, where is this God of yours? These are the things that I go over and over emptying out the pockets of my life. I was always at the head of the worshiping crowd, right out in front, leading them all, eager to arrive and worship, shouting praises, singing thanksgiving, celebrating all of us, God's feast. Why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? 
Fix my eyes on God, and soon I'll be praising again. He puts a smile on my face. He's my God. When my soul is in the dumps, I rehearse everything that I know of you. From Jordan depths to Hermon heights, including Mount Mizar, chaos calls to chaos, to the tune of the whitewater rapids. Your breaking surf, your thundering breakers, crash and crush me. Then God promises to love me all day, sing songs all through the night. My life is God's prayer. Sometimes I ask God, my rock-solid God, why did you let me down? Why am I walking around in tears, harassed by my enemies? They're out for the kill, these tormentors with their obscenities, taunting day after day, where is this God of yours? Why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God, and soon I'll be praising again. He puts a smile on my face. He is my God. And that's the end of chapter 42. There is a quick pause here that I'll read, and then we can chat about that. This is uh, for chapter 42, verses 1 through 11. Psalm 42 takes up some common experiences that we all have of disappointment with God and others. It builds on the basic revelation that we were created for relationships with God and with other people. The psalmist uses three metaphors to shed light on those relationships. A thirsty deer is the first metaphor. What water is to the deer, God is to you and to me. We simply must have God, and it must be the living God. Nothing stale or stagnant. The deer runs past all of the mud puddles and swamps and marshes to clear, flowing streams. I don't want what is left over from God after last week's thunder shower. I want him fresh, flowing, living. What I learned in Sunday school in the third grade won't satisfy me. What I read in the Bible last week won't satisfy me. What someone told me this morning on television or the radio won't quench my thirst. I want to get the water myself. I have to have God. Every thirst, every hunger, every longing for satisfaction is a metaphor for the fundamental longing in our lives for God. Crashing waves are the second metaphor in the psalm. When life is more than we can handle, we cry out for help. But that very experience implies that there is a way in which life can be handled. What we call trouble, living through circumstances that are beyond our strength or abilities, leads people of faith to discover God's strength. And that's what the psalmist did. Overwhelmed by the white-capped swells of life, he climbed into the lifeboat that was God. And there, in the storm, he waited, he trusted. He believed. There, with the wind howling all around him, he learned to sing. A lawless society is the third metaphor. Society is filled with deceptive people who are out to get us. We know that there is a cure for injustice, a solution to oppression, and an answer to unfairness. Malice, wickedness, and crimes are symptoms for which God has already given a diagnosis. Just as every experience of need opens us up to receive his help, so every act of injustice creates an opportunity for us to share his deliverance. Hmm. And that's the end of the pause. Good stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm heavy burden today. So Hmm. Psalm 42 is actually a good one. Just a reminder that Christians have those days of just feeling a little and it's okay to have those conversations with god yeah yeah i just feel like there's just a little bit of a wall and i'm yeah so i've been actively working during this reading trying to like please god take these little walls down take Mm. these barriers away let me be fully engaged let me please so yeah it's so it was good to listen to some 42 yeah from that vantage point And now we are rewinding back a little further 
over to Leviticus, and Heidi will be picking up at chapter 14. All right. God spoke to Moses. These are the instructions for the infected people at the time of his cleansing. First, bring him to the priest. The priest will take him outside the camp and make an examination. If the infected person has been healed of the serious skin disease, the priest will order two live, clean birds, some cedar wood, scarlet thread, and hyssop, to be brought for the one to be cleansed. The priest will order him to kill one of the birds over fresh water in a clay pot. The priest will then take the live bird with the cedar wood, the scarlet thread, and the hyssop, and dip them in the blood of the dead bird over fresh water, and then sprinkle the person being cleansed from the serious skin disease seven times and pronounce him clean. Finally, he will release the live bird in the open field. The cleansed person, after washing his clothes, shaving off all his hair and bathing with water, is clean. Afterwards, he may again enter the camp, but he has to live outside his tent for seven days. On the seventh day, he must shave off all his hair from his head, beard, eyebrows, all of it. He then must wash his clothes and bathe all over with water. He will be clean. I don't know if you have ever shaved off your eyebrows before. It's an interesting look. It, I was going to say, like, it would be unmistakable mm-hmm. <laughs> who, who is going through something like exactly. this back in these days. And they didn't have big razors and shaving cream. So no. all this shaving of the head and, I mean, interesting. Mm-hmm. Really, it is. It is. It is. All, all right. The- carry on. <laughs> The next day, the eighth day, he will bring two lambs without defect and a yearling ewe without defect, along with roughly six quarts of fine flour mixed with oil. The priest who pronounces him clean will place him and the materials for his offerings in the presence of God at the entrance to the tent of meetings. The priest will take one of the lambs and present it and the pint of oil as a compensation offering and lift them up as a wave offering before God. He will slaughter the lamb in the place where the absolution offering and the whole burnt offering are slaughtered, in the holy place, because, like the absolution offering, the compensation offering belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest will now take some of the blood of the compensation offering and put it on the right earlobe of the man being cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. Following that, he will take some oil and pour it into the palm of his left hand, and then, with the finger of his right hand, sprinkle oil seven times before God. The priest will put some of the remaining oil on the right earlobe of the one being cleansed, on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, placing it on top of the blood of the compensation offering. He will put the rest of the oil on the head of the man being cleansed, and make atonement for him before God. Finally, the priest will sacrifice the absolution offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from his uncleanness, slaughter the whole burnt offering, and offer it with a grain offering on the altar. He has made atonement for him. He is clean. If he is poor and cannot afford these offerings, he will bring one male lamb as a compensation offering to be offered as a wave offering to make atonement for him. And with it, a couple of quarts of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, a pint of oil, and two doves or pigeons, which he can afford. One for an absolution offering and the other for a whole burnt offering. On the eighth day, he will bring them to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting before the presence of God. The priest will take the lamb for the compensation offering together with the pint of oil and wave them before God as a wave offering. He will slaughter the lamb for the compensation offering, take some of its blood and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed on the thumb of the right hand and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest will pour some of the oil into the palm of his left hand and with his right finger sprinkle some of the oil from his palm seven times before God. He will put some of the oil that is in his palm on the same place as he put the blood of the compensation offering, on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, on the thumb of the right hand, and on the big toe of the right foot. The priest will take what is left of the oil in his palm and put it on the head of the one to be cleansed, 
making atonement for him before God. At the last, he will sacrifice the doves or pigeons, which are within his means, one as an absolution offering and the other as a whole burnt offering along with the grain offering. Following this procedure, the priest will make atonement for the one to be cleansed before God. These are the instructions to be followed for anyone who has a serious skin disease and cannot afford the regular offerings for its cleansing. God spoke to Moses and Aaron, When you enter the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to you as a possession, and I put a serious fungus in the house in the land of your possession, the householder is to go and tell the priest, I have some kind of fungus in my house. The priest is to order the house vacated until he can come to examine the fungus so that nothing in the house is declared unclean. When the priest comes and examines the house, if the fungus on the walls of the house has greenish or rusty swellings that appear to go deeper than the surface of the wall, the priest is to walk out the door and shut the house up for seven days. On the seventh day, he is to come back and conduct another examination. If the fungus has spread in the walls of the house, he is to order that the stones affected by the fungus be torn out and thrown in a garbage dump outside the city. He is to make sure the entire inside of the house is scraped and the plaster that is removed be taken away to the garbage dump outside the city. Then he is to replace the stones and replaster the house. If the fungus breaks out again in the house after the stones have been torn out and the house has been scraped and plastered, the priest is to come and conduct an examination. If the fungus has spread, it is a malignant fungus. The house is unclean. The house has to be demolished. Its stones, wood, and plaster are to be removed to the garbage dump outside the city. Anyone who enters the house while it is closed up is unclean until evening. Anyone who sleeps or eats in the house must wash his clothes. But if, when the priest comes and conducts his examination, he finds that the fungus has not spread after the house has been replastered, the priest is to declare that the house is clean, the fungus is cured. He then is to purify the house by taking two birds, some cedar wood, scarlet thread, and hyssop. He will slaughter one bird over fresh water in a clay pot. Then he will take the cedar wood, the hyssop, the scarlet thread, and the living bird, dip them in the blood of the killed bird and the fresh water, and sprinkle the house seven times, cleansing the house with the blood of the bird, the fresh water, the living bird, the cedar wood, the hyssop, and the scarlet thread. Last of all, he will let the living bird loose outside the city in the open field. He has made atonement for the house. The house is clean. These are the procedures to be followed for every kind of serious skin disease or itch, for mildew or fungus on clothing or in a house, and for a swelling or blister or shiny spot in order to determine when it is unclean and when it is clean. These are the procedures regarding infectious skin diseases and mildew and fungus. Mm, Lots of good stuff there. Some of the same things that we still put into practice today with Mm. mold and mildew. I mean, look at what my son works for, a restoration company that goes into houses after they've been flooded or fire or whatever, just to... But they are really big on Mm. the whole mold thing and getting things dried out. Yeah, it can have some really serious health uh, issues that that it can cause. So, yeah, these are truly, it's for the benefit and well-being of the people. And so here we are, Leviticus chapter 15, talking about, drumroll, bodily discharges. That's right. It's going to be an exciting chapter in Leviticus. Hmm. God spoke to Moses and Aaron, speak to the people of Israel, tell them when a man has a discharge from his genitals, the discharge is unclean. Whether it comes from a seepage or an obstruction, he is unclean. He is unclean all the days his body has a seepage or an obstruction. Every bed on which he lies is ritually unclean. Everything on which he sits is unclean. If someone touches his bed or sits on anything that he has sat on or touches the man with the discharge, he has to wash his clothes and bathe in water. 
he remains unclean until evening. If the man with the discharge spits on someone who is clean, that person has to wash his clothes and bathe in water. He remains unclean until evening. Nobody likes a spitter. I mean, no. why would you spit? I mean, that's just... Don't spit on people. Don't spit on people. Every saddle on which the man with the discharge rides is unclean. Whoever touches anything that has been under him becomes unclean until evening. Anyone who carries such an object must wash his clothes and bathe with water. He remains unclean until evening. If the one with the discharge touches someone without first rinsing his hands with water, the one touched must wash his clothes and bathe with water. He remains unclean until evening. If a pottery container is touched by someone with a discharge, you must break it. A wooden article is to be rinsed in water. When a person with a discharge is cleansed from it, he is to count off seven days for his cleansing, wash his clothes, and then bathe in running water. Then he is clean. On the eighth day, he is to take two doves or two pigeons and come before God at the entrance of the tent of meeting and give them to the priest. The priest then offers one as an absolution offering and one as a whole burnt offering and makes atonement for him in the presence of God because of his discharge. When a man has an omission of semen, he must bathe his entire body in water. He remains unclean until evening. Every piece of clothing and everything made of leather which gets semen on it must be washed with water. It remains unclean until evening. When a man sleeps with a woman and has an omission of semen, both are to wash in water. They remain unclean until evening. When a woman has a discharge of blood, the impurity of her menstrual period lasts seven days. Anyone who touches her is unclean until evening. Everything on which she lies or sits during her period is unclean. Anyone who touches her bed or anything on which she sits must wash his clothes and bathe in water. He remains unclean until evening. If a man sleeps with her and her menstrual blood gets on him, he is unclean for seven days, and every bed on which he lies becomes unclean. If a woman has a discharge of blood for many days, but not at the time of her monthly period, or has a discharge that continues beyond the time of her period, she is unclean the same as during the time of her period. Every bed on which she lies during the time of the discharge and everything on which she sits becomes unclean the same as in her monthly period. Anyone who touches these things becomes unclean and must wash his clothes and bathe in water. He remains unclean until evening. When she is cleansed from her discharge, she is to count off seven days, and then she is clean. On the eighth day, she is to take two doves or two pigeons and bring them to the priest at the entrance to the tent of meeting. The priest will offer one for an absolution offering and the other for a whole burnt offering. The priest will make atonement for her in the presence of God because of the discharge that made her unclean. You are responsible for keeping the people of Israel separate from that which makes them ritually unclean, lest they die in their unclean condition by defiling my dwelling, which is among them. These are the procedures to follow for a man with a discharge or an omission of semen that makes him unclean. And for a woman in her menstrual period, any man or woman with a discharge and also for a man who sleeps with a woman who is unclean. And friends, that's the end of chapter 15 and the end of our reading today. There was one thing that stood out to me about the woman being unclean. It reminded me of the woman who touched Jesus's garment, that she led a life of being unclean. Mm -hmm. Like it said in there, I don't know the exact date, but years. it was like years so that means sitting down, going to sleep, being around people. Everything that you read here are things that she was not welcome or 
part of a community mm-hmm. to do. People couldn't touch her. Couldn't touch her. Couldn't, hey, sit, let's sit down and have a talk. Let's just sit down and see how you're doing today. People couldn't do that with her. So, and the other part that I found interesting about the woman and going to see Jesus then, right? Mm -hmm. Is that Jesus didn't go bathe after she Mm -hmm. touched him. He -hmm. looked at her and he forgave her sins. And then he went on because it was the new law, right? Mm Mm-hmm. We didn't have to do all those things. So this woman who everyone knew was ritually unclean went and touched Jesus and was healed. Yes. There was no, now Jesus has got to quarantine himself and do this. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. There's a lot of women, I think, that can struggle with different aspects of how women are portrayed as you read the Bible. And I'm I'm one of them. There are things I struggle with, like the if you have a baby girl, you're banished for twice as long. And I did research that, like I said, and I'll say it didn't make me feel better. It it basically most people agree that yeah, it's a punishment because girls weren't valued. So it's a punishment for the shame of bearing a girl and she had to do twice as long because she's also paying for the uncleanness of her daughter that she gave birth with, and it left me feeling not good. I struggled with that, so I brought it to God, said, I don't understand it. I don't like how this makes me feel. It's like punished for giving birth to what I am, mm-hmm. a woman. Yep. And it's, it's hard to take, but when I look at Jesus, he didn't treat us this way. He didn't banish us for longer. He didn't punish us for being a woman. He didn't treat us as less than for being a woman. And in fact, he also treated women as honorable and worthy of his time. And I think as a woman, try to focus on Jesus because that is God. That is how he sees us. That is the fulfillment of all of these laws. Jesus is that. Right. Yeah. I know it doesn't make this easier. No. Yeah, it's these are the things that are hard hard for me to yeah. sit and listen to because I'm going to be honest and very human here. I would have hated this as a woman. And where does a woman go with those feelings or was it accepted because we're just second class citizens that are worthless mm. and it's just accepted that yeah. I am worthless? You're an unworthy, meaningless waste of woman. And that's really hard to sit with right now. We are so glad, though, that Jesus came back and restored that. And Oh, absolutely. Yes. But my, it's the empathy. I'm, I'm, I have empathy for people to no end. What comfort did any of these women have? Who comforted them? Who made them feel special and loved? Nobody. I'm sure Even the their... law made them feel less than. Even their mothers, like, because of you, I had to be gone for a lot longer. Why couldn't I have been a mother to a son? We didn't want you. And, well, at least I only have to deal with you until you're like 12 or 13. Then we'll sell you to some old Jehoshaphat over there. He'll take you. But <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to read these and see where women found any kind of comfort and sense of belonging because it doesn't read that they had that do you think they had a community of women that were supportive of each other like kind of their own little women's group i mean we're we're obviously hypothesizing i know and whatever but you know i can only hope so but for what i mean it's not that you could talk about but god sees us as equal no you get together and say well, I sure wish that I had more value. I mean, you know, it's hard to say about those conversations because they wouldn't have been able to converse about things that didn't sit right because then they could be killed for that. Yeah. So I really, I have such a hard time because my empathetic heart is like, I want to take them all to my house. It's like, you don't have to do this stuff. But before (laughs) Jesus, this is what God required and he has not yet helped me to understand why it sounds so unfair to be a woman 
And that's maybe part of the journey through the message. That right? probably is. As we go through and uncover little things. And friends, we don't have any big fancy degrees sitting no, on our we wall. Don't. We are just two people that are passionate about <laughs> yes. Jesus. Yeah. We're passionate about each other. We love sharing our stories. And mm-hmm. we love going through this version of the Bible and just sharing our thoughts, our feelings, and also some of our personal yes. experiences. And we're glad that you were on the ride with us. If you have any questions or comments or anything like that, feel free to drop them down in the comment section. And if you have any prayer requests, Heidi and I love Mm, to pray for people. We frequently will talk about people while we're on the road or just throughout the day. And we'll throw up little Hail Mary prayer passes to God. We do. On behalf of people because it matters to us. And we know that prayer is powerful and that it Mm. works. So if you have any prayer requests, we check all the comments. We engage with people. If you want to send it private messenger, go ahead and do Mm -hmm. that. You don't have to put your business out, you know, for the world to see. We would be happy to pray with you and for you. Right. And you don't have to give any specifics or details if you don't want to. And I will throw my prayer request out there, and I and I actually mean this sincerely with all my heart. Pray for me over this because I'm really struggling with Leviticus, and I am really looking for some answers that help me make sense of this in the aspect that God himself didn't look at all these women and said, I love you far less than I love these men. I mm-hmm. love you 50%, but the men I love 100%. So I really could use your prayers over me as my mind sifts through this information. If you are able to help me understand that these weren't a punishment and that women weren't hated and seen as nothing, I would really appreciate that because I really kind of need that right Mm. now because I didn't have a good attitude about Leviticus today. Prayers for that and anybody who may have an understanding (laughs) that I don't have, I am waiting. (laughs) I'm waiting for you. So thank you. And friends, just like that, we are done with today's reading. It has been another wild ride through the Bible with all sorts of little twists and turns But we are happy that you're on this journey with us, and we are happy to be going through this. So we will see you next time for episode number 46. We are on the march towards 50 episodes through the Bible, and we're going to do something fun, I think, on episode number 50. Number 50? Can I, like, make a dessert or something, like a celebration? Well, that wouldn't be very fun for our listeners who are in other states or, I mean, we need to do something that they might think is fun. So I've got Uh, a little trick up my sleeve. Okay. And we'll see what happens. All right. So friends, thanks again for joining along. Have a great day and a great week. And I hope that wherever you go, you just feel that little sense of peace uh, that passes all understanding. Yes. We will talk to you soon.